Hello, this is David Sloan Wilson for the This View of Life podcast. And I'm so happy to be talking with Stu Libman. Hello, Stu. Hello, David. And uh, I have a quite a long-winded introduction to get through. In the first place, this is going to be the newest podcast on Atlas Hard. I have done a number of these uh, with such wonderful colleagues exploring different areas such as the nature of fiction, uh, economics and politics, spirituality, philosophy, and um, Atlas Hugged is proving to be such a great portal, fictional portal, to these deep discussions um, about the real world. And today the topic is going to be uh, contextual behavioral science, which is a term familiar to some, of course, uh, but very unfamiliar to others. And so, um, and so that's going to be exciting. And, um, and I'll begin by setting the stage a little bit, talking a little bit about Atlas Hugged, and then I'm going to pass it to you, Stu, to talk a little bit more about contextual um, behavioral science. And so Atlas Hugged belongs to a literary genre that's sometimes called hard science, fiction, science-based utopian novels. Uh, it's most directly written as a sequel to Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged, of course. And Ayn Rand had her philosophy of objectivism, which she thought could be justified entirely by rationality and science. And uh, she, she wrote about objectivism as a philosopher in nonfiction, but Atlas Shrugged, her, her novel, was unquestionably the most powerful vehicle for her to convey this philosophy. And, um, and so uh, this brings up, among other things, just the whole concept of why is it that a story can be such a powerful vehicle as opposed to just talking about it as a scientist or an intellectual or a philosopher. That'll be part of our conversation. But um, Atlas Hugged also bears comparison to another book, uh, which is Walden Two by B.F. Skinner, and that comes much closer to home with our contextual behavioral science uh, audience. And so Skinner, of course, needs no introduction. He was the main figure associated with the tradition of of uh, behaviorism, and um, and Walden Two was his vision of how what a future might be like if it was based on the science of behaviorism. And um, I love to tell the story that, uh, that um, Walden II was rejected by two publishers and accepted by the third, only under the condition that he write a textbook for them. And so, and nevertheless, although it uh, might not have been the finest novel ever written, it had a tremendous influence because it was a story and many listeners to this podcast will be will have Walden Two in their past, just as uh, as others have Atlas Shrugged in their in their past. But Atlas Hugged goes beyond Walden Two in the same way that it goes beyond um, Atlas Shrugged, because the whole science of con contextual behavioral science, although it is based in many ways on, on behaviorism, has also gone beyond it. And in fact, uh, terms that we'll soon be tossing around, such as ACT and RFT, um, in short, the whole nature of symbolic thought and language, which Skinner thought that he could explain entirely in terms of operant conditioning, turns out, well, maybe not so much. And that's precisely where contextual behavioral science has, has gone has gone beyond it. And then a final point I'll make is that um, Atlas Hugged is, is written so much to be hard science fiction, in other words, to be describing something that could take place in the, uh, in the real world that I actually made the cover of Atlas Hugged, there's the cover of Atlas Hugged, as similar as possible to my latest nonfiction book, his view of Life And in the ep epilogue of uh, Atlas Hugged, it's called The Science Behind Atlas Hugged, I, I, I invite the reader to cross over 
to the real world and to work with me and my colleagues in order to make the vision of Atlas Hugged a reality. And what would that be but to actually cross over to the work that I'm doing with you and the great work that you're doing in order to evolve the future at scales large and large and small. So that's why we're calling this a meta conversation. It reflects upon itself at multiple terms. And uh, and so now with that long-winded introduction, Stu, I'll pass it over to you. Please introduce yourself. You'll be well known to some, but not all. And then provide your own introduction to um, contextual behavioral science, ACT, RFT, and all that. Well, indeed. Thank you, David. Uh, so I'm Stu Libman. I am a child and adolescent psychiatrist, and I serve as the medical director of a school-based partial hospital program for youngsters with diagnoses on the autistic spectrum. We're located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and, and we have all the services of a hospital, but the kids go home at night. Uh, we have been anchored in principles of contextual behavior science, applied behavior analysis uh, for the better part of three decades now. And over the last 20 years or so, we gradually have been weaving ACT, acceptance and commitment training. In therapeutic settings, it's called acceptance and commitment therapy, but we're going to refer to it as acceptance and commitment training and relational frame theory. So over the last couple of decades, we've been weaving this more and more into our program. And over the last several years, uh, we've also been weaving pro-social, a topic that you and I will be talking about more as the interview goes on, into the fabric as well of how we, uh, how we think about our program, how we administer our program, really how we manage ourselves uh, day in and day out. And, and so it's around this uh, pro-social uh, based in uh, multi-level um, uh, evolutionary science that, that's really caused our paths to cross, David, as you know, over the last several years. And so we've had some opportunities to present together and to work together. And, and so I'm really thrilled about uh, an opportunity to bring contextual behavior science and Atlas Hugged together uh, conversationally. Um, I think that's enough by way of introduction. The rest of it can kind of flow because I have some slides that are going to start to speak to introducing the topic as well. Yeah, that's great. And in many ways, you're interviewing me here, <laughs> or at the very least, it's going to be a two-way uh, conversation. Uh, but I do want you to say a little bit more on the relationship between therapy and and training. ACT, that T can stand for therapy or training. But that's an important point that I'm always eager to um uh, establish and and how do you describe the fact that the T can simultaneously stand for therapy or training? Well, I think because especially from my perspective, we put such emphasis um, in applied behavior analysis in ACT uh, as well on skill training. We can really focus on building skills for how we manage ourselves and how we orient to leading lives uh, of personal meaning and value. We can do that in a work context. And, and I, have a, I have a background in uh, sports psychiatry where the focus there too is on skill building. And, and, and so in work settings, in organizational settings, I think we're much more focused on how do we build people's skills and how do we expand their sense of perspective and orient themselves to their broader environment and help to align what they're doing individually with what we're asking of them to do organizationally. That's different from a therapeutic context where people may come in more because they're struggling with particular issues. And, and you know, I mean, our common humanity doth prevail. And, and so we need skills across both contexts but in a work setting, uh, we, we wouldn't be all that likely to do the kind of deep dive perhaps into personal history or relationship issues. Not that they aren't showing up there and not that we don't all carry that with us. But I think that the nature of the contract, if you will, is different. And so in respecting those different contracts in an organizational setting, I'm more likely to talk about training. Whereas in a consultation room, in therapy, 
the, the emphasis would be more therapeutic. Same skill set, different contract, different agenda. The way I put it is that on the bell-shaped curve of functioning, if you're on the extreme low end, then you need therapy. Uh, but no matter where you are on that bell curve, you can benefit from training. Even the most elite athletes benefit from training. And the same basic principles apply for the whole bell curve in many ways. So, uh, so that's not no. So no matter what your current level of functioning, these ideas are for you. Is is the way I, I like to um, uh, put it. Everyone can improve um, from these powerful ideas. So why don't you now go through your slides um, and uh, and introduce these powerful ideas? We'll be familiar to some. Um, but not to many others. And so this is a great uh, chapter of our interview here just to get this little tutorial that you have here. All right, well, I'm transitioning to slide sharing, always a risky part in a presentation like this. And, and actually, I wanna drop back, David, I wanna drop back uh, to the mid-1970s and, and move forward to explain why I'm viewing this interview as kind of a coming home and okay. why I'm ever so appreciative of the opportunity to talk with you about this. Great. So it turns out, uh, in my third year of medical school at Case Western Reserve University, a psychiatrist and a neurologist at Ro the University of Rochester, George Engel, published an article in Science on the need for a new medical model, a challenge for biomedicine. A and this was, this was really cool stuff. I mean, this made a huge difference for, for a group of us who, who, you know, we were already struggling. It was our third year of medical school. We were learning patient care. It was already pretty challenging. Whatever issues we had with authority were going on. And here was this guy who came along and challenged all of medicine, saying that we really needed an expanded focus and we needed to proceed much more comprehensively. And this, as I'm sure you'll know, David, was going on at the same time that James Lovelock and Lynn Margulius were talking about the Gaia hypothesis. And so they were really expanding our awareness of really needing to think contextually about what was going on. And so starting to bring in these more expanded levels of understanding really had a major influence on me personally to the point that uh, I, this helped influence me to pursue training in psychiatry. It, it led me to pursue additional training in family therapy. And as we're gonna talk about in a moment, applied behavior analysis and contextual behavior science are very much um, models of context that invite us to put a wider angle lens on the camera, which really set the stage for my encounter with you and with the idea that we really needed to think more expansively about our individual human dilemmas. Now, part of the problem with the biopsychosocial medical model is that it looks hierarchical, and it is, but it doesn't really tell us where to begin, and it doesn't really explicate connections between levels enough. But as I was preparing for this conversation with you, this came to mind. And so it, it kind of feels, as I say, like a coming home because it's bringing me back to, uh, you know, kind of where I started uh, in, into more of a contextual kind of approach. Yeah, well, I mean, the, uh, basically the stack of symbols that represents the true objectivist movement is uh, basically the individual, the group, the society, and the world. And so, uh, I mean, it's uh, a very strong connection indeed. Well, I thought you might get a kick out of it at any rate, and it came to mind, so I figured if it came to mind, I would include it. But <laughs> as, as we move on then, a group of colleagues and I in Pittsburgh have developed what we call our elevator slide. You know, if you had one slide to show to do a presentation or one slide to drive a presentation, what would that be? And so the image we came up with, um, recognizing that we're anchored in principles of applied behavior analysis, um, is that of, of a tree. And, and the applied behavior analysis is, is where we, we reference the work of B.F. Skidder and, and know that we stand on his shoulders for the way he invited us to start looking at behavior in, in, in context to look at the way 
uh, consequences so much select our behavior, even though we all tend to focus more on antecedents as causes. But he, he taught us about reinforcement and about punishment, about rule-governed behavior, uh, about the way we, we follow rules and, and how do we do that. He also pointed us towards language. I mean, he did, he looked at verbal behavior and talked about how do we start to label things and how do we start to ask questions. So he really was setting the stage for what was to become um, contextual behavior science. And, and uh, then over the last, uh, now better part of 40 years, you know, credit to Steve Hayes and his colleagues here in the U.S. and to Dermot and Yvonne Barnes-Holmes and their colleagues in Europe uh, this really now, David, is a global community. There are labs all over the world looking at relational frame theory, which is basically a behavior analytic theory of language and cognition that asks, uh, how do we come to use words, right? How can I have words on a screen and say those words and have you start to take them in? And how are we going to have a podcast where we explain and pursue relational frame theory? How do we follow rules? How do we start to use symbols in our heads to solve, solve problems? But, oh, oh, by the way, that becomes kind of complicated, doesn't it? Because I can talk with you about these words I'm using, but if I start to worry about how am I coming across and what's going to come of the questions you're going to ask. And if I were to start getting caught up in my questions and worries, why then that same language that can so empower us to solve problems can also draw us into kind of the dark side of the force and we can really get caught up in our own, in our own machinations and, and start to lose track of what's going on in the world around us. And, and so relational frame theory starts to inform acceptance and commitment training, where here the focus is on helping us get less caught up in those anxiety-laden thought processes and more oriented to the world and who and what matters to me and how am I going to get back on track with a valued course of action when emotional reactivity to life events starts to knock me off track. And so language really enters into the way we start to think about helping people learn to accept, make room for their anxious thoughts and feelings and worries, and yet commit to a valued course of action. And so language really enters into how we proceed up our tree. So we do ACT training, and we do it in the service of promoting psychological flexibility, the ability to stay on track. It's not a matter of do we get knocked off track, we're going to, but do we have the requisite flexibility to take in what life deals us and come back to that valued course of action? And as we're able to do that in organizations, we can start to influence performance within those organizations. This is where that skill training that I was talking about earlier starts to enter in. And it can be all kinds of organizations. It's not limited to mental health agencies, but this can extend to all kinds of organizations around the planet. And then, and this presages a bit of what I hope we'll talk about a little later into this conversation, once we bring in pro-social, once we add in the core design principles of successful organizations, for which Eleanor Ostrom won the 2009 Nobel Prize in Economics, once we add that in, we can start to look not only at our own tree differently, but we can start to get a sense of our tree and the whole forest and how the whole broader picture starts to fit together. And, and so when we use the term contextual behavior science, what we're talking about is all of this. We're talking about expanding applied behavior analysis uh, 
and, and taking into account these other layers and levels of development. And we're really trying to proceed scientifically. We're really trying to proceed with precision and scope and depth and trying to predict and influence behavior. So let me, let me catch my breath and, and let me check in with you. You know, before we move on and start to look at RFT and ACT more specifically, by way of a, a general introduction, David, you know, keeping into account that we're talking to different audiences, what, what ought we add from your perspective? Well, my friend, first of all, that was brilliant. I know that you've done it many times, but it's a polished stone that you just provided us. And, um, and I'm just so admiring, I want to say, because I feel, when I dabble in this myself, I feel like I have imposter syndrome. This is not my background at all. And when I see someone like you do it, I just, I just, um, I admire you. Um, like I would admire a karate master, master or something like that, or just performed a perfect kata. So, um, but what I, wa what I most want to do is to, uh, Describe the parallel development in my field of evolutionary biology, which, uh, which for the most part during the 20th century was confined itself to genetic evolution and had nothing whatsoever to say about cultural evolution or, or um, uh, language or, or symbolic uh, uh, thought. But that started to change, and, and um, just to fast forward to the present now, we see that symbolic thought is very distinctively human and is a, um, has become a, a second stream of inheritance. So now this is called dual inheritance theory. And the capacity for symbolic thought is being regarded as much like our genotype. So that uh, every one of us, everyone listening to this is a collection of genes. We call that their genotype. That influences to an extent, who they are, anything that could be measured about them, we call that their phenotype. And anyone with a little biology under their belt knows about the genotype-phenotype relationship. What's new within the field of evolutionary biology is to think that every person also is a collection of symbols. Let's call that their symbotype. And that symbotype influences who they are, that very same phenotype, that very same phenotype. And to think about our symbols as like our genes is in some ways just kind of converging upon what others who have studied symbolic thought for all along um, have already known. But there's something very powerful about the metaphorical transfer of thinking of our symbolic systems as like our genes subject to a product process of evolution. And of course, that process is, or at least can be, much, much faster than the process of genetic evolution. And so that means that there's a convergence of evolutionary thinking with relational frame theory. And the overlap is uh, uh, almost non-existent. Very few people and uh, I know I can speak that I don't know anyone actually who's begun to think about symbolic thought from an evolutionary perspective, who's even heard of relational frame theory. That's the degree to which I keep talking about the ivory archipelago, mm -hmm. archipelago of knowledge, these things being on separate knowledge. The reverse is, not so, uh, is, uh, is less true thanks to the efforts of Steve Hayes and myself and and others who have been who have been actively, very actively evolutionizing the contextual the CBS community, and so quite a few of the leaders of relational frame theory actually have become knowledgeable about evolution, and it's very exciting for us. So this is this is a very rapid period of integration, and um, and so there's my reflection, but I'm eager for you to uh, to continue, Stu. And then, um, and then for any uh, listeners out there who are wondering, yes, we will be getting to Atlas Hugged. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and so what's, so what's way, so way cool about this, David, right, is, I mean, this is the course of my career trajectory. This is the course of your career trajectory. You know, I was a biology major in undergrad, and I taught 
uh, mammalian anatomy and I went on to medical school and you know, none of this was part of what I was learning back then, right? This is all talk about postgraduate meeting after you graduate education, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's what all this is. Well, okay, so, so there's a, a more complex model of ACT called the Hexaflex, but borrowing on the work of Kevin Polk, and his colleagues, I'm going to introduce ACT via the matrix and pretty quickly look to tie it into RFT so that we can indeed start to bridge to uh, Atlas Hugged. So, so when we talk about the ACT matrix, we make two main discriminations. We discriminate outer behavior from inner behavior. You know, if we put a video camera on you, we would, we would see what was going on, but that's very different from inner behavior. And RFT is kind of this horizontal line that takes us from outer behavior to inner behavior and where our symbols and our symbotype starts to kick in. And just to insert, uh, just to insert Stu right there, basically inner mental experiencing symbotype, outer phenotype. So that, that symbotype phenotype relationship is right there in the matrix. There's the that's how strong the convergence is. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. Yes, yes, absolutely. And then we distinguish towards and away, you know, towards meaning moving towards things that matter to us, away meaning we what we do to move away from our distress. Now that's more complicated than just towards and away, because uh, on the towards side, you know, there there can be challenges and uh, associated with doing things that matter to us. And on the away side, some of us actually like the way we misbehave. <laughs> so it's got its upside. So uh, so we have to be careful. It's not quite as black and white as, as these words seem to make it be. But we wind up with uh, four quadrants and each quadrant has a question. Uh, I'll do a word first and then a question. But here the word is valuing. And the question is simply who or what is important to you, right? And this is where from an RFT perspective, we start to tell emotional stories. So as soon as we ask that question, we're into the world of symbols, right? We're into the world of language and, and asking how, how does that develop? And also, Stu, also, Stu, into the world of stories. And so here's basically a segue that, I mean, so much of this is built upon stories, personal stories, metaphors, uh, which is a sh sh very short story, um, and so on. So, right, we're beginning to work our way towards a story, such as Atlas Hug, um, right away, but please continue. Well, and indeed, and, and how, you know, how do people respond to this kind of question? I mean, it's the stuff of our lives, right? Who or what matters to you? Uh, hello, my life and my family and my kids and and so, right, and so we start to tell stories. Of course, the plot quickly thickens because as soon as we start to care about anyone or anything, distress starts to show up and we have to entertain this question of what shows up that gets in the way of caring and shows up is the operative notion, right? We don't go looking for distress, but it just, it just shows up, right? And again, now we have more stories, maybe with a different emotional cast to it, but we have more stories with stories of distress, our worries, our frustrations, the judgments that we make, right? The, the concerns that we have about why me? And, and so pretty quickly, we're into the world of distress that goes along with caring. And uh, Stu, again, I'm going to break in just to just to establish these these connections. That when we look at that list on the left side, we can see that they are adaptive in a limited sort of way. That basically the person, when they're in that frame of mind, is in some kind of defensive crouch or offensive crouch. Uh, but if you but but they're getting their way in some limited sense, uh, just not in the sense that they would need to to be on the right side of the, of the uh, matrix. But it's not difficult to understand uh, what's showing up there on the left uh, side of the uh, matrix from an evolutionary perspective. And in fact, there's very, very powerful psychological mechanisms, uh, deeply instinctive, modular. This is like the evolutionary, psych what, what a lot of people associate with evolutionary psychology. Um, uh, of the sort of like Cosmetes and Tubi and so on, uh, as opposed to the, the, uh, the, the Skinnerian uh, 
uh, tradition. So there's much to be said there. The main thing I want to emphasize is that uh, there's something on the left side of the matrix which is, which can be um, seen as adaptive in the evolutionary sense of the word, but not aligned with the normative goals on the right side. Well, the adaptive part, though, right? So this is not about good and bad, right and wrong. I mean, you know, Robert Sapolsky tells us that zebras don't get ulcers because they don't do what we do. But, you know, it was adaptive to worry, right? You know, a breeze wafting through the grass or a crouching tiger, right? right. Better to be worried yeah. and better to assume tiger and be wrong than breeze and, right? As uh, our colleague Kelly Wilson tells us, you know, it's, uh, you know, you don't want to wind up being lunch. Yep. Well, but we humans know what to do, David, with this distress, right? We try to get away from it. And so here the question is, what do you do to move away from your distress? I mean, the human stress response is so-called fight, flight, freeze. And so before we get to Atlas Hugged and, and start to talk about uh, individualism and how that enters in, you know, more commonly, <clears throat> we all have our ways, you know, we all have our favorite away moves of what we do intended to alleviate our distress. Mm -hmm. The challenge, of course, is one of engagement. It's what can you do, you know, to be engaged in, in your valued pursuits. There's a hierarchical, here's a little bit of RFT. There's a hierarchical relationship to be established between valuing who and what matters to us and, and what behaviors then ensue to demonstrate to others, to ourselves and to the world that we care. And, and, and so we're not looking for esoterica, right? I mean, how do you show someone you care? Well, you know, you, you hang out with them. You go have a cup of coffee. You check in to see how they're doing. A and the challenge we all face is how do we move towards, right, being engaged along with, not instead of, our distress. And, and this is a real key distinguishing factor about ACT, that we, we say, you know, instead of challenging the irrationality of your distress, we say that stuff's going to show up, you know, that's what our minds do. How do we come back to doing what matters over and over and over again? That explains the key terms, acceptance and commitment. Acceptance is accepting that that stuff exists, as you just said. And commitment means committing to make your way one way or another, work around those obstacles into that top uh, right quadrant. So uh, there's your key terms, acceptance and, and commitment, as I, as, I, uh, as I understand it. Indeed. And, and, you know, one of my colleagues uh, calls this marching northeast. He calls it marching northeast, sometimes into the teeth of a nor'easter. But, but this is, right, I mean, this is Joseph Campbell talking to us about mythic quests, right? I mean, how does the hero march on in the face nice. of adversity? Nice. You know, orienting towards his or her values and, and, and getting knocked off track and coming back over and over and over again. Nice. I, I had not made that connection, but it certainly is a strong one once made. Well, and, and uh, uh, before we move on to looking at these questions at the level of groups, we also can come back now to Atlas Hub, right? I mean, I, I know you did this absolutely magnificent interview a couple of years ago with the Dalai Lama. And, and so even in Atlas Hub, we see themes of Buddhism running through. But the Buddha in that lower left quadrant taught us that the three poisons are greed, hatred, and delusion. A and if you then ask, well, what do we do about that? Well, we know what to do with greed. You know, greed unchecked, greed on the left side of this matrix. A and there's some interesting RFT, isn't it, right? Left and right. Now, we're not talking about political. But if we start to use left and right too very much, it's only going to be natural that in our minds we're going to relate that to what's going on politically. Now, this can be related to what's going on politically. I mean, look at how much greed 
and, and trying to cope with greed through accumulating more and more and avoiding the distress that we're all, you know, basically in the same boat. Look at how much that informs Atlas Hugged, right? The, that kind of individualism that Rand or Rant was talking about, right? It's all upper left quadrant behavior. It's not like individualism is a bad thing. Right over on the right side, an individual pursuing valued goals and objectives is is important. But over on the left side, greed, hatred, delusion, starting to believe stories that I hear with our human need for coherence. You know, it's a slippery slope from what the Buddha is talking about to conspiracy theories and me starting to lead my life over on the left side, losing track completely of who and what matters to me as I get more and more caught up in how much I hate and blame the others, how much I'm trying to accumulate for me, um, how much fear is driving me. So we start to see an awfully powerful explanatory paradigm, explanatory in terms of human behavior, but I also think with some very strong connections with the issues you're identifying in Atlas Hugged. Yeah, well, let me, this is very rich, uh, uh, Stu. Let me just uh, put it, pull out some some aspects to it. On the left and, and right, for example, this brings in multi-level selection. I mean, just imagine that uh, there was a group in a, um, a, a life and death group situation, but a righteous one, like the way we think about World War II when we're battling Hitler. Um, then uh, what would show up on the right side of the matrix would be all about heroism in battle, uh, so on and so forth. That would be squarely on the right side of the, of the um, uh, matrix when what is important to you is the preservation of your people, your people, and, and prevailing against a great evil. Um, and so, um, and on, on the upper right would be all of the virtues of war, warfare. Um, so, and yet that, of course, just turn that a little way, and that could all end up on the left side of the matrix in terms of if, 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 the, if the group is a terrorist group or, or something like that. But, of course, that's not how they see it. And so this is bringing in this, the, the fundamental import of multi-level selection, that basically what's virtuous at one level can become evil at another level. Uh, and then when you, when you pursue that argument to the end, it just, it, it mandates a whole earth ethic. We have to be working for the welfare of the whole earth and then organizing everything else underneath it. Anything short of that will actually create dysfunction up the up the scale. It need not be warfare. It could be something as benign as growing the economy. All nations trying to grow their economies, that's a good thing. That might seem to be on the right side of the matrix, and except when it overheats the earth. All of a sudden it ends up on the left side of the matrix. So it's, uh, it's that complex. It's that, it's that complex. And then the other point I want to bring out is, is the distinction between fact and fiction. And the importance of telling the truth, well, it turns out that if we're merely evaluating what's on the uh, um, inner part of the matrix, our symbotypes, then, and the degree to which they uh, cause us to behave in a way that's appropriate to the environment, um, the distinction between fact and fiction is not really, I mean, it's all kinds of ways to do that with fictional stories. We, using the word stories is, is in there. And so the idea of adaptive fictions uh, is, comes really out here. And the whole importance of truth-telling, wh when does it become important? Because we see that there's, the world is full of symbotypes that uh, evolved and adapt people to their environments, create strong communities, cause them to do things which are on the right side of the of the of the matrix and they're they're total fabrications uh, so so um, the whole distinction between fact and fiction when facts need to be respected when not so all of this is sort of implicit in what we're talking about very very deep 
deep um, issue. So, uh, so uh, continue, Stu. Well, so I, I will indeed. Let's continue with exactly the points you've been making, David. So if we think about the matrix as a camera with uh, uh, variable lenses, now we can start to put a wider angle lens on our matrix camera. A a and so staying oriented in our elevator slide, now we're gonna move over to the left side uh, and start to look at the same set of questions at the level of the group. A and so our lower right question becomes modified, right? Who or what matters to you or to your group? And now we're back into emotional stories, but we can start to weave in some of the language of Atlas Hugged. Uh, you know, tissues are not just left-sided phenomena, but we have to be careful, as you were suggesting, because we can get caught up on our emotional stories on the right side and, and start to tell ourselves adaptive fictions and get too caught up in, in missing, right, that there's still this left-sided set of concerns that arise, too, now at the level of the group. A and... Then what do we start to do? Well, we start to enact our emotional stories. I was consulting a couple of years ago to a university. Um, actually, the whole faculty was struggling with the, the question of, of how do we shift from the millennials to the iGen? And, and what we were doing before doesn't seem to be working. And one of the issues that came up was in the lower right quadrant, the importance uh, of really attending to issues of diversity and inclusion. But one of the things that emerged as we talked about it was if in the lower right quadrant you're going to celebrate diversity and inclusion, human nature being what it is, you need to make room for the tribalism that's going to show up on the lower left quadrant. And then all the fight flight kind of reactivity in the upper left quadrant that's going to show up as part of tribal behavior. Well, and so our challenge, right, is still to enact our emotional stories. Ah, but David, now with a difference, because now we're going to bring in the community of scholars, the community of scientists. Remember, I said that RFT now has labs all around the world and people are really testing out assumptions and really looking at how do we get beyond conversation to really starting to do experimentation and test out these ideas and, and see what really holds up in terms of our uh, ability to predict and influence behavior with precision and scope and depth. And here, uh, Stu, I wanna make a point I'll make two points. I've been eager to make one, um, and now there's another. One is that um, that uh, part of the uh, Skinnerian and applied behavior analysis um, tradition, uh, very high standards of scientific research. I think the reason why behaviorism became so prominent when it did was because of its standards of scientific research. Of course, it could could be scientific because it was just focused. It wasn't 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 needed did not need to be internal it was just environmental inputs and behavioral um, um, outputs but ever since uh, the the contextual behavioral science community has had high high standards for scientific research I was amused when I first met these folks like Tony Biglin and Steve Hayes and Dennis Embry it seemed that they were name dropping the term randomized control trial every third sentence they were so <laughs> That was their um, uh, ethos. And so this research is underpinned by literally hundreds of uh, randomized control trials, which are listed on the website of the Association for Contextual Behavioral Science. And just recently, Steve was crowing that the number of meta-analyses was reaching 100. On that listing, there were now 99 meta-analyses of, of studies demonstrating the efficacy of this. So, so that's amazing. And then something else, which is amazing also for people who um, 
whose idea of therapy is something like Freudian psychotherapy that's just, just you know, not efficacious, takes a long time, and, and so on and so forth. And on that same point, something that is amazing to me to discover, and I think most people who aren't familiar with it, can be truly amazed at how fast this can work, how fast this can work. Because we think of therapy as something that takes your whole life on the couch. Um, but um, this can work so fast that uh, there's a recent paper by uh, Andrew Gloucester, our very distinguished colleague, it was a 15 minute intervention. He called it a, a, a micro intervention. 15 minutes of this way of thinking delivered to couples improved their prosocial behaviors with uh, each other. Amazing. So speak a little bit to that, Stu. Why is it not only that this works, but that this could work that fast? Well, if you, David, if you just kick back and just take in this slide, right? So so imagine I'm talking, don't ask me quite why I took it on, because it's sort of crazy even when I talk about it still, but I'm talking to 600 faculty from across a university. And up on the screen in front of them is a slide like this with diversity and inclusion in the lower right, tribalism on the left, right? Upper left has kind of the fight flight behaviors, the, the aggression that's going on, the cancellations that are going on. And, and then in the upper right, you know, there's this question of, okay, well, allowing that, you know, tribalism isn't a problem. Of course it is, but it's not. I mean, it's, it's part of what shows up for us, right? It's part of our evolutionary history. We can then look at the whole thing and say, okay, well, knowing this now, what's going on in the upper left isn't a problem. It's the flawed solution. We need some other solutions that we can road test in the upper right. And so perspective taking, that 3D box in the middle of noticing, right, of stepping back out of the plane is there. And so we're really able to help people step back and alter the function of behavior, right? That the stuff on the left side now isn't a problem. It points us to what we need to start doing differently to be more the kind of people we aspire to be. Um, Kelly Wilson says it one way. He says values and vulnerabilities are poured from the same vessel. So we can see the connection between lower left and lower right. Steve Hayes says we care where we hurt and we hurt where we care. And he talks about pivoting from the left to the right. I'm going to break in, Stu, because um, um, in evolutionary language, what that means is that, and I said this, I was writing this this morning in, a, in an article that I'm, that I'm writing. I've said it a thousand times that basically prosociality in all of its forms, other oriented behaviors, benefiting others and one's group as a whole, is inherently vulnerable to more self-oriented behaviors. The, or the vulnerability of um, pro-social behaviors is what uh, Kelly and Steve are expressing in those apt phrases. And then um, this also, your question also invites the next slide, right? Because we also ask, well, okay, so why are we talking about this as an evolutionary model? And, and you know, I'm going to talk about this it, it, you know, as if I know what I'm talking about. But this next, this slide may be the one where I feel most indebted to you and Steve Hayes for the way you really opened my eyes to what's going on here. Be, because the essence of evolution, right, is variation and selection and retention or replication. Well, look what happens here with variation. As we become more accepting of our distress, more open to having the distress show up. David, now we can start to entertain different possible forms of behavior, different functions of behavior. Uh, 
and, and so the accepting part, the openness skill set starts to speak to bringing in variation. And then our values start to help us select which new behaviors to row test. And those that work are ones for which we're positively reinforced. And those are the ones that are retained. And those are the ones that get replicated. And so to uh, Stu, back, could I stop you? Could I stop you here? Just it's a, it seems shoot. like a detail, but it's an important one to me. If you could go back to the previous slide, and I hope we're not getting too much into the weeds here with our audience. But if you, there you go, that's the one, um, the one with variation there. Mm -hmm. uh, not on my. There we go. That's it. Um, now when I tell this story, it's just like what you did, except for me, what. Uh, what uh, the matrix is doing is that actually in the absence of therapy or training and you get trapped in the left side of the matrix, is what basically is what's called fusion. Uh, your behavioral repertoire becomes fused around avoiding. That's kind of the variation that we're seeing on the left side of the matrix and it's a very mm -hmm. limited form of variation and the whole point is we need to defuse is, is the act way of putting it but what that means in evolutionary terms is we're extending the range of variation into the right uh, upper quadrant. If it's variation then we're in the upper part of the matrix and, and uh, what we're doing is we're taking individuals that are sort of um, um, operating only on the left side of the matrix as far as they're their behavioral repertoire is concerned, and then we're expanding the range of variation into the right quadrant. And so the variation would then, would then what I want to see <laughs> it, pictorially is the variation spanning the, the whole left to right uh, continuum of the quadrant. And then, now what you say next about selection and retention, then that properly exists on the right side of the quadrant. So that might seem like a detail. If you could comment on it, uh, then we'll... Um, well, yeah, a a absolutely. And so that, I think, starts to speak to that earlier vector, David, from lower left to upper right. Yep, yep. A a and here, th these same three boxes, because there's variation and there's selection and retention in the context of our lives, right? Yep. So, so there are three major functional skill sets that we focus on within ACT. Opening. Um, engaging and awareness. And so we do skill training in each of those three. And so, yes, that, uh, that may overplay the variation by locating it there, but it's intended to convey the process that's underway <clears throat> of as I start to become more skilled in, and more aware and more oriented to my values, then I can start to entertain new ways of behaving best reflected perhaps by that vector from lower left to upper right. We could think about that as, you know, a vector of the mythic quest. We could think about that as the vector of psychological flexibility, uh, of right. opening up and entertaining new behaviors that then can be road tested by our values. Yeah, and I want to actually walk back something I just said. Um, um, which I, I commented on how, how fast it could all be, um, which is true in a limited sense, but then it's equally true um, that um, it gets still better, but, but practice, practice, practice is required. And in some ways, this is a world that you step into and you get better and better at it. Uh, and you need to do it in a practicing sense. Uh, it's not just something you learn once and then, you're, and then it's has its entire effect. Could you speak to that fact that A, Yes, it, it does begin to work very fast, but B, that it is um, an experiential process, uh, something that you take on and it just becomes your world, your, your new symbol type in a sense. Uh, could you address both of those things, uh, how, how those go together? Well, indeed, it, it's kind of like all four of Tim Bergen's questions all at once, right? I mean, history matters because... <clears throat> 
you know, we can be pretty entrenched in our histories and depending on the degree of trauma and what life has dealt with us, you, you know, we may be living a left-sided kind of stuckness, really caught up in our rules and in our thoughts and, and our reactions and, and find it very difficult to entertain new possibilities for behaving differently. And, um, you know, uh, Donald Hebb, back in the 1950s, the Canadian neurophysiologist, psychologist, yeah, taught that? us that neurons that fire together wire together, right? And if our neurons have fired and fired and fired, it's not like we're going to unlearn anything. It's not like the old way isn't going to show up. The challenge is, you know, can, can we have the requisite flexibility to derive new kinds of relationships and start to entertain new possibilities for behaving differently, uh, you know, when the same alarm bells from the past go off. A and so the, the, the horizontal line here is a line of function. You know, it asks, in this moment, is what I'm doing more oriented towards alleviating my distress, the away side of it, or more towards, meaning towards here, you know, enacting my values. And, and, and so history matters, history of the species, the way I've developed, um, you know, how I function, and, and what's available to me mechanistically, what tools are available to me, right? I mean, th this matrix isn't a thing, right? It's a procedure. It's a procedure for trying to get at the way I tell myself stories, the way I relate symbols and the emotions that go along with it. And it starts to look procedurally at, are there some ways I can move a little differently with the same old, same old? Um, it might seem that uh, we're never going to get to Atlas Hard, <laughs> but we will. And uh, But I'm inspired now to dwell on the distinction between behavior, cognitive, and mindfulness-based therapy. And what comes to me about this is that uh, you got to have behavior therapy because that's that Hebb's matching law kind of experiential thing that we were talking about, neurons that fire together or wire together. Um, <laughs> um, but then the reason that cognitive therapy goes beyond it is that, is that by just basically changing your cognition, framing the way you think about it, it could actually have a kind of an instantaneous effect because that's how, how much we are a symbolic um, uh, a symbolic uh, species. That's something that can be very fast and how ACT works with on the basis of metaphors, a single metaphor, like the bus metaphor or the chess metaphor. Um, uh, just, you know, it, that's what metaphors do. And that's what symbolic thought does. And that's why symbolic thought goes beyond just Skinnerian operant uh, conditioning, but then there's another sense which I'd like you to come from you better than me, is how mindfulness therapy goes beyond cognitive therapy. Uh, if you could just give a little mini lecture on that, then we'll continue on our way. Well, you know, cognitive behavior therapy it, it tends to more challenge what's going on on the left side. Act more would say, take it along with you. You know, we're not going to challenge your doubts and your anxieties and the irrationalities. We're going to say, you know, when that shows up, if you can step back and notice it, right, if you can become aware, if you can be mindful, then that same distress can be a signal to slow down and pay attention. Because, you know, David, over on the left side, we don't get upset about things that we don't care about. And so we, if what's going on in the left can lead me to wonder, well, wait a minute, what is it that I care about such that I'm so upset? Oh, wait a minute. Now I'm on the right side. And now, as Kevin Polk says, you know, do something small, even if you don't know exactly, just do a, a random kind act for another person, but do something small to engage in acting that valued motivation. 
And then that turns then, back to behave, the behavioral part, basically. Right? Now you're reinforcing your. Now you're reinforcing yourself. You're selecting, um, so, and replicating, basically. For, um, so yep. Yeah, and so you know um, that noticing part, that mindfulness part. You know, we've stripped it of the context in which mindfulness arose. It was always, you know, back in the day of the Buddha. I mean, it was embedded in the four noble truths. It was part of getting on track with leading a valued existence. Uh, Stephen Batchelor has brought Buddhism, well, it's interesting because he says he's going back to the origins, but he's brought it in in a secular way. And instead of talking about the four noble truths, he talks about the four tasks. And he uses a pretty cool acronym, pretty cool for me because our favorite German shepherd was a dog named um, Elsa. And his acronym is E, embrace, embrace life in all its agony, in all its ecstasy. L, let go of suffering. And not the suffering that's part of life, the suffering we superimpose through our upper left quadrant ways of trying to get away from our distress. And when we do that, we can stop. That's the noticing. We can step back and we can act. That's that vector from lower left, the eightfold noble path, if you will, but that's that vector from lower left to upper right of noticing what's going on with us and starting to live a more valued path. And, and that's, that's the challenge we face. And although, you know, it may not feel like we're quite into Atlas Hugged, you, you know, I, I think we're pretty there with it, David. You know, yeah, I think we we're, are. We we're are. talking and, about uh, we're we're talking about you know the old story and how entrenched it can be, and how sometimes you don't challenge the old story, you start to tell a new story, a different story. Yeah. Well, let's 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 get right there and let me basically introduce the context of Atlas Hugged, in um, uh, with the Matrix, so we can just leave this slide on. Did you have more? Do your slideshow, Stuart, or is this your last slide? Um, I have I have uh, some stuff about uh, Ostrom and pro social. If we wind up getting there as part of this conversation, but but this is a good point to to pause and breathe and hug. <laughs> well, let's uh, let's um, first talk about Atlas Shrugged, Ayn Rand's book, and um, and the quote that I love, the, my favorite quote that I positively love in, about Ayn Rand is when she said, art is the essential medium for the communication of a moral ideal. And, uh, and so now we're bringing art into it, stories, but of course we've already introduced the idea of stories. We're a symbolic species and, and we deeply, deeply, deeply think in a narrative, in a narrative um, uh, sense. And Atlas Shrugged is indeed conveys a moral worldview. When you step into it, and if you accept its premises, then uh, you are behaving morally. You are behaving in a way that will work out best for every uh, everyone. Uh, the fact that it doesn't actually turn out that way in the real world is something that we'll get to. But in the mind of the believer, they are uh, very much the heroes of their journey. And, and the podcast that I recently did with Michael Shermer, he quoted a, some, a passage from Ayn Rand, and it was so heroic, you know, the individual prevailing against, uh, it was the hero's journey, for sure, that uh, the individual should be sticking to their beliefs and so on and overcoming them against all, all um, um, odds. And so in the mind of the believer, uh, uh, they're very much operating on the right side of the, of the um uh, matrix with their belief. And this explains why Atlas Shrugged appeals to, always has appealed to two different audiences. First of all, powerful people who like to be told that their intentions for themselves are morally pure. Um, that's why it's the libertarian um, worldview. But also young and idealistic people at the dawn of their adult lives. It just appeals to this sense of possibility, their own aspirations, which are uh, mostly pro-social aspirations, but often young people are chafing against parental authority or other kinds of, of authority. And the idea that you can just shrug that off, Atlas Shrugged, is enormously 
um, appealing. Uh, too bad that when you actually look at the consequences of that, um, then it, it moves the world in a in a very dark uh, dark direction. And in the in the in the novel, I call it the morality of the cancer cell. Cancer cells proliferate faster than the solid citizen cells of the bodies, and in a perverse way, that's adaptive. Um, evolution is just about differentials. Evolution has no foresight. If something is is uh, proliferating faster than its neighbors, it's adaptive in the evolutionary sense of the word. And as long as you're comparing adapt uh, cancer cells to to uh, uh, normal cells, the cancer cells can boast a certain kind of success. Look at how fast we're growing, they could say. Everyone should go as fast as us. That's absurd for cancer cells, mm -hmm. and it's absurd for the body politic. politic. And so literally, um, you can describe not just Ayn Rand, but individualism in all of its forms. The idea that the individual is the fundamental unit, everything social can be reduced to the motives and actions of individuals, and somehow, which is what the invisible hand metaphor is all about, somehow we could all just strive at the individual level and that will work out for the benefit of society as a whole. That's the morality of the cancer cell. Somehow we could all proliferate and um, and and should all be uh, doing so, and so uh, so there is a case of of uh, a symbotype, which is really captivating, and the mind of the believer puts them um, in uh, uh, on the right side of the matrix in their hero's journey, working around obstacles, all the all the constraints of societies are on the left side of the matrix, and you're you're crossing that divide, that diagonal into the right side of the matrix, but that's not how it works in the real world. And that's why uh, adaptive fiction's like that. Um, and of course, in the novel, well, and, uh, objectivism... And if I may, if I may yes, David, sir. right? And, and, and we all have all of this going on, right? It's not that, you know, there's left-sided and right-sided people, right? I, I mean, we all have all of this going on, and, and you know, it's not as if greed, hatred, and delusion belongs to them over there, right? But but it's also not that that uh, everyone doesn't have some degree of aspiration, and so right, it's 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 a balancing act, and it's yep. a balancing act of how what's going on with me individually aligns with what's going on with my group too. Yeah, yeah, and now let's bring in Christianity in the in the. Uh... In the novel, there's two main figures. Well, there's a number of main figures, but the, the main male protagonist is John Galt Twee. Um, he's rebelling against the objectivism of his father and grandfather and grandmother, Ayn Rand. And then uh, the female protagonist is Eve Eden, <laughs> who comes from a devout Christian household and is escaping that. And, and Eve Eden, when she tells her story, she comes to question her faith, and she says, you know, I just, it wasn't just that that my pastor and church were using Jesus to tell me to do wrong because she lost her virginity to her pastor. Um, would she do it for Jesus? That didn't, wasn't what made her mad. It was that they, they were using Jesus as a tool to make her do right. And, well, and all this malarkey she was being asked to believe, why couldn't she just... Why wasn't it possible to tell right from wrong without peering through a tissue of lies, she says. I want to, all I want is to tell right from wrong without peering through a tissue of lies. That's what John Galt wants, too. Her tissue is Christianity. His tissue is objectivism. Isn't there a way that we can tell right from wrong without having to peer through a tissue of lies? In other words, something which is entirely science-based, and that's what the new objectivism uh, Becomes, and I think that stories, when they, when they, when they, when they're told as adaptive fictions, then they have that property of they, they work so well on the, on the on the bottom half of the matrix in terms of in terms of uh, creating a, a meaning system, but what they cause you to do on the top half of the, of the matrix depends entirely on the context on the context. Uh, and if the context is mismatched, basically, 
then uh, you're going to be end up behaving maladaptively on the left side of the matrix, but you might not know it. You might not even know it. Uh, in which case you'll be you'll be captured by your meaning system and you'll be behaving maladaptively to the end. So so that, that's uh, now we're now we're in the middle of the story and I'll, I'll please take your turn. Well, I was just thinking about the extent to which, you know, evolution prepares us for what was. And, mm -hmm. and the challenge we all face is, uh, you know, orienting to the front windshield and, and moving into what's to be. And, and how do we do that creatively? And, and that's also where I think the science becomes so important because we can look for right and wrong, but but we also have to look at how, how do we test what's next and test what's next and test what's next. And, and uh, you know, I, I think that uh, your story orients us in that direction as well. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And then back, crossing back over to the real world, uh, it's very much a theme of pro-social and everything else I do that the only way forward is by a managed process of cultural evolution. I have a series of conversations on this view of life called um, Evolution Complexity in the Third Way of Entrepreneurship, which makes this point, actually makes this point comprehensively in this series of, of uh, conversations for all social change efforts. Two things don't work and only one thing can work. One thing that doesn't work is laissez-faire because it's just not so that the lower level pursuit of self-interest benefits the common good. The other thing that doesn't work is centralized planning because the world is too complex for it to be comprehended by any group of experts. What's left? We must, we must form targets of selection, we must orient variation around the target, and then we must replicate the best practices. And that's precisely what we've described for the matrix here at the, at the individual or the group level that's precisely what we've described as a managed process of mm -hmm. personal and cultural evolution. But at larger scales, like you take such things as the smart cities movement or regenerative agriculture or any kind of national economic policy, at that scale, what it takes to have a systemic target of selection, like an equitable economy, um, a zero carbon footprint, something like that, to orient variation around, that's like, you know, the creation of markets and, and that sort of thing um, calls for a more extensive set of tools. But it is what needs to be done, top to bottom. The only way forward is by, by a, um, a managed process of, uh, of cultural evolution. And might that serve as a segue for us to touch on Ostrom? Sure, sure. Why don't you, uh, you take the next turn? Well, so so I going back to our elevator slide, I said that we bring in pro-social and then we start to see our tree, but the whole forest differently. And so now if we take our our group uh, matrix and add to it the core design principles um, of successful organizations uh, that Eleanor Ostrom identified across the course of her career, I think everyone can see just how clearly her first core design principle, and it's a principle, right? It, it's it's it technically in terms of uh, rule governed behavior, we can look at it in RFT terms, but but what we're really looking at here is um, not so much a rule as much as her saying your organization needs to find some way to attend to this. She's not really saying here's how you do it. But, but she's speaking to the lower right quadrant of the matrix. Core design principle one just maps so clearly um, onto that quadrant. Let me, uh, let me reinforce that, uh, uh, Stu, that, that these core design principles are functional principles. You mentioned Tinbergen's four questions. <laughs> I love it that we have this vocabulary where that's just a household word, but, uh, <laughs> and it will be for some, but not all of our, um, of our readers. For the rest of you, get wise. Read my book, This View of Life, and we'll barrel on here. But, uh, but um, uh, Eleanor emphasized that these core design principles are functional design principles. They don't tell you how to do it. They tell you what needs to be done. And I think that's why they belong in the valuing 
uh, part of this. And first and foremost, if you're going to do something as a group, you better know what that group is, who's in it, what its boundaries are, so on and so on and uh, so forth. If, if, if you don't have that, then it's not likely to work. Well, and as an organizational consultant, um, I, I can use these as a form of organizational diagnosis, right? I mean, I can start to look at these different principles in terms of how how is this organization functioning and where are problems occurring when they're occurring. Because again, there, there has to be some way of attending to uh, responsibilities and costs and benefits. Uh, there has to be some way of handling decision-making that's functional for the group. And not every group is going to handle two or three in the same way, but some way does need to be found. And, and then we also need some way of monitoring of what our colleague Paul Atkins talks about as transparency, uh, of, of everyone you know, having some way of keeping track of what's going on. Um, and, and of being able to um, implement positive reinforcement on the right side when it's warranted and, and, you know, catch them being good is still, you know, a pretty solid basic principle of child development. And it turns out, you know, adult development too. But at the same time, you know, we humans misbehave and we may understand the function on the left side, but the point is sometimes there needs to be sanctions um, it's not a question of, is there going to be conflict? If it's a human organization we're talking about, of course there's going to be disagreement. Of course there's going to be conflict. It's, do we have some way of managing that while at the same time, right, we're respecting authority across levels for individuals, but for teams and departments, for, uh, you know, autonomy to be respected, and then, you know, David, one of my favorite principles is this one, uh, principle eight, collaborative relations with other groups or, um, because th this is the one that really allows us to kind of, as Emerald would say, kick it up a notch, right? This is oh, the basically, one Basically, that, that's, uh, that's the forest in your, in your elevator slide, the, um, abs from, from, from the tree to the forest. Because with that one, right, that's the one that allows us to take all eight of these at the next level up in the system a and really ask, you know, are we orienting to the community and to the nation and then to the entire planet? I mean, not that that's not quite a leap. Um, and not that there aren't some issues with talking in that way these days, but nonetheless, yeah, that's the one that really allows us to uh, expand our focus. A and, y you know, it just, uh, all of this just so imbues Atlas Hugged, right? We see it from the village school to the redneck community to, to the way... Um, the uh, whole process is being catalyzed, right? I mean, you've just woven Ostrom in to the entire story. Well, that's for sure. And uh, so the small group, as as close to a utopia, the small and a, the small and appropriately structured group, doing meaningful things, um, as as close to a utopia as we'll ever get, is uh, is indeed um, uh, woven throughout the novel. Uh, um, there's a number of small groups, as you just said, and each one is described as a, as a, um, as a utopia. Yep, absolutely. Well, uh, Stu, let, let me have you kind of take the lead here. Uh, we've described so much, and you've described, I think, the, this amazing uh, environment that we've created for ourselves with uh, ACT and RFT and ProSocial and putting it to use and in uh, real world settings, we're so lucky. We're the, the what is it? The lucky few is that what B. F. Skinner described? <laughs> Behaviorists. Um, all of that is in the real world, and then there's this novel I wrote, and uh, I would just love you to continue speaking as to what the novel, uh, or any novel, including this one, adds to all of all of this. I didn't mean it to be. Um, a vanity project or something separate from this. And for me, this is joined at the hip with um, um, our real world change efforts. But if you could just take the lead here and, uh, and I'll respond to your questions, if you, if you don't mind, as to, uh, as to um, what this uh, novel adds to the wonderful things we're doing and 
in the real world? Well, in in the real world, the the two questions I struggle with the most are first of all, how do you engage people? R- right, because because it's not just that we tend to hang out on the left side, although I think we do, right? I mean, we're all kind of caught up in our stories, in our views, us and them, uh, you know, conspiracy theories and anti-conspiracy theories, but but we all can get pretty locked in. A- and some of us, um, you know, can be pretty impervious to change. And challenging an existing story is pretty tough. But where does the motivation lie? And how do you start to engage people in stepping back, right? Because once we can step back, um, you know, noticing or in Ostrom's terminology, monitoring, but once we can step back a little bit, um, there's, uh, there's room to entertain a little bit of difference and a little bit more and a little bit more. But there's the issue of engagement and that's woven throughout your novel. And then there's the issue of how do you scale this up, right? How how do you start to move um, to higher levels of a system, right? I mean, I see that as a child psychiatrist when I go into a school, if I'm going to go into a classroom and I'm going to talk to a teacher, I'm never going to do that without stopping by and saying hello to the school principal. You know, it's his or her school. Uh, in the project that you describe um, in Binghamton with uh, your Regents Academy, right, you were able to get in and start to to deal with the structure of the program and, and alter how things were going, but to take that out to a school system, right? Or to start to expand beyond. Yeah, and, but and, the way at which I failed which I failed at abjectly at that level. So so just to just to let everyone know, that's tough to, you can succeed. I call this the paradox of practices that work but don't survive or spread. You can do something that works and it'll still be killed off. Um, uh, can be, uh, and that's I think the um, courtesan principle seven and eight, which have to do with between group uh, relations. You could be doing everything just right and still be a casualty by uh, circumstances beyond your beyond your uh, uh, control. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, our colleague Tony Biglin talks about rebooting capitalism. Right, capitalism is not the enemy to be defeated. You know, the profit motive is there. And yet at the same time, right, how, how do we put that wider angle lens on the camera and start to move more broadly? And, um, you know, I, I mean, uh, of those two questions, you know, engagement, uh, uh, that one I'm working on, it's challenging. And sometimes the answer is it's just not going to happen here. Um at the same time, um, this this issue of scaling up is just ever so challenging, and I think that's where that right that's where art um, meets life because right that's the cutting edge of the pro social research, right? If we're going to value science and if we're going to come back to our evolutionary model and road test pro social, then then that's where you know we really need our research colleagues to be thinking about how do we move with this organizationally, how do we create, you know, for ACT, we have 400 plus RCTs. Well, you know, we need that for this too. And and so how do we solidify our base and how do we start to scale up is very much the question. And so, you know, when, um, when Galt Camp starts showing up around the world, you know, and the whole world is lighting up. Well, in the story, you know, we've we've got that engagement. How we start to do that in the world in which we hang out with what's going on in the world in which we hang out. Man, now we're into the domain of challenge. <laughs>
Yeah, well, this gets to the nature of stories in general, and, and um, I had a whole podcast on that with Brian Boyd, who's one of the few great literary scholars who thinks about lit literature from an evolutionary perspective. Mm -hmm. One of his books is called The Origin of, of, uh, of Stories. But there's two things about stories, I think, and I'm just really fascinated by this. In general terms and for my own book, is about how a, a novel or a story can serve as a vehicle for implanting a worldview in someone or a group better than any sort of nonfiction discourse. Why is that? And I think that explains a whole bunch to me. I, I, I'm always amused at how both Atlas Shrugged and Walden Two, by most lights, don't really qualify as very good stories from a pure just storytelling standpoint, and yet still had their effect. And my explanation for that is that when we hear a story and either embrace it or not, it's primarily for the moral worldview that is conveyed by the story. And if the moral worldview resonates with us, we will forgive flaws in the story, because what we're really after is the more the sense of right and wrong that it conveys. If it's a well-told story, then so much the better. And that explains, for example, why there's no book out there, no novel out there that's universally loved, not a single one. Name your favorite novel and someone else will not even be able to slug through it. Isn't that interesting? It's not just a matter of the storytelling quality. It's a matter of, the, it's, it's the world view. And, and so when you embrace a story, you're opening your mind in a way that is seldom opened in, and, and that's what you were calling about engagement. And I think that two reasons why that's true for a story is that the, the moral universe is, I mean, right prevails. I mean, the, it's only the odd kind of countercultural story where, where there's, there's not a sense where things don't come out right. And, and, uh, and so justice prevails, right prevails, and there's such a great feeling. And basically, that makes you want to turn the real world into the story. Um, and you know, when you when you begin to think about cultural evolution seriously, that we're always experimenting, as you say, we're forming targets of selection. What does that mean? But that we're imagining something that does not exist, and then we're bringing it into existence. That's what cultural evolution is. That's what niche construction is when we talk about it in scientific terms. And so the whole act of conscious evolution is one of telling a story and then making it a reality. That's what it is. And it really blurs the distinction between between fiction and and nonfiction. When you really take social construction and niche construction seriously, it is the act of turning, converting fiction into nonfiction. And then next point, in, in addition to creating a moral universe um, where, where right prevails, is, is emotion. And I was interested when you were walking us through the matrix, how much emotion that word came in. And of course, the story is imbued with emotion, deep, deep emotion, uh, shame, love, and so on. Are, are intrinsically part of a story and are almost intrinsically stripped from nonfiction discourse. Or if they're added, they're added in a way that's just dilute and pale compared to what you're able to do in a story. So in a story, you can jack up the emotion to, um, you know, level 10, and you can create a moral universe that, that uh, where things come out right. And all of these things are so, are so compelling um, in comparison to the, the nonfiction discourse that, we're, that uh, we all also, of course, must engage in. So they must be linked to each other. They must be linked to each other. Well, and, and, and then where stories show up in the world of science, right? Because at the same time that I was learning about the biopsychosocial medical model, and the Gaia hypothesis, right? I was becoming more aware of Thomas Kuhn's work on paradigm shifts, mm 
where, you know, like a floater in our eye, something off to the side that uh, some people want to dismiss as part of the, you know, the normal science in which they're engaged, but like this uh, little discrepant floater starts to catch our attention, right? And it doesn't quite fit with the existing story. We humans crave coherence, but, but some things just don't quite fit. And, and if you think about it in the context that you're talking about, David, right? A, a paradigm shift is starting to tell a different story within science. A, and, you, you know, for, for me, I mean, a biology major and, and focused on medicine, you know, I went to, I trained in, in a bastion of biological psychiatry that I think, interestingly enough, missed, missed biology and getting so focused on the brain and not taking into yeah. account... Yep, right, not taking into account multi-level selection theory, which right, I mean, I, I, I mean, for me, that was paradigmatic. That was like, wait a minute, whoa, 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 you know, it's like, no, that's not out there. That's in here. That's part of this, and and, and so, you know, I mean, for me, that's a different story within science. Well, there's something I want to go here because um, our friend and and a colleague, Paul Atkins. Also Steve Hayes, but Paul I know because he's co-founder of ProSocial World with me, is we talk all the time. He's really having fun and writing about the idea of the individual person as a group and a group of somethings, call them voices, perspectives, somethings, um, um, that need to be cooperative and often are not. I wonder what your own thoughts are on this concept that uh, not only are we thinking of groups as individuals, uh, but but to think of an individual person as a group. I'd love to have your thoughts on that, uh, Stu. Please, please, please do. Well, yeah, it, it, it is interesting just to, to step back, right, and think about how how similar and different we each are across the different contexts of our lives. Right. I mean, uh, most of us try to put our best foot forward in public, <laughs> which is kind of worrisome when we see some of the feet being put forth in public these days. Right. And and then we're a little different, you know, with our nuclear family and with our extended family, with what goes on even within days. Yeah, it, it, it's it's an interesting concept. Uh, right. And the integration does have to happen in a broader, broader kind of way within the individual so, uh, so yeah, that certainly sounds like a worthy area of pursuit. Well, one of the main uh, act metaphors, as you know, is the imagine that you're a bus driver and you're trying to get to a destination. People are getting on and off the bus. Most of them are nice, but some are not nice. Some are downright scary. So do you stop the bus and spend all your time getting the bad people off the bus? Or do you accept the fact that there's bad people on the bus? And, um, and reach your um, uh, destination. So in the first place, there's an example of how a metaphor, which is a story, a little kernel of a story, you know, after you think, oh, that's interesting, right away can make you behave a different way. I mean, there's the, you know, a surgical insertion of the, of the, of the story, the metaphor, into your brain, alters your symbotype, and can alter your behavior right away. So that's interesting. But also, of course, the metaphor inherently envisions the individual as a group <laughs> because that bus is the individual just as much as the driver is the, the, um, the individual. So I think that, that metaphor actually gets to the idea of the individual as the group, uh, the well, bus with the many people in it. Well, and you know, and there's no driver. I mean, some people, David, will write me, me noticing for that 3D box. You know, I, I mean, I do the noticing because me, right, it, is, it's another verbal behavioral construct, right? Now there's the observing self or within act, the contextual selfing. But it's not like there is a self there. I mean, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, the, the Vietnamese Zen master, talks about how when he looks at a flower, he says a flower is composed of entirely non-flower elements. So he looks at a flower and he sees 
soil and nutrients and sunlight and water, and it temporarily coalesces in this thing that we call a flower, but it's an ongoing process. And, you know, then we humans come along and what do we do, right? I mean, we kill the flowers, we cut them off and we put them in bunches. And then I guess as a, as a gesture of our undying love, we give someone a bunch of dead flowers. <laughs> <laughs> it's better we should give potted plants, you know, and, and take better care of the earth. But, but yeah, so there's this selfing process, right? And, and if we can step back, it's still an unfolding process, but at a little higher a level. Right. Well, the whole, it's, it's, yeah, the whole aim of Buddhism is to get people to abandon or to to go beyond that uh, sense of self and to adopt a more systemic um, uh, systemic uh, view. And uh, another thing to point out there is my colleague Joe Henrik, um, newest book is called "The Weirdest People in the World." Weird stands for Western Educated Industrial Rich Democratic. Point being is that, uh, and of course, ninety nine percent of scientists come from that culture, and so, uh, and yet, it's very peculiar um, compared to other cultures. So we're only scientists are only discovering the um, the true extent of um, of um, cultural diversity, and that that goes for the sense of self. And so, the idea, the Western sense, the weird sense of self, is actually not at all a human uh, universe. The Big Five is not a human uh, universal. Even, you know, you'll probably remember Julian Jaynes and the bicameral mind, the idea that there was a time when people truly heard voices, truly heard voices. That's how they became. Even that's probably within the repertoire of human cultural variation. And there you get back to the individual as as a group, including, you know, people that are in, in, the, in the deepest sense of the word are other people speaking to you. So that's how flexible the mind is. That's how diverse cultural variation is. And, we're, and that's only dawning upon us because 99% because, um, because of culture and, and, and scholarship takes place um, amongst this one peculiar uh, culture. How interesting is that? Well, and so, right, and so your book, your novel gets a, a different story in play, right? And uh, it, 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 what's the game we're playing? Evolution, right? Variation and selection and retention. I mean, it's going to be really interesting uh, to see what comes of it, right? I mean, it, 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 can that be selected? And is it going to start showing up in college courses? And is it going to, right? I mean, what's what's to come out of it? I'm sure you're intrigued by that too and, and doing what you can to uh, continue to catalyze the process. Uh, but the, the, the conversation we're having, right? I mean, it does fold back on the story and the story folds back on this conversation in a really cool kind of way. Yeah, and I think I can end it unless you want to continue it. But we've, of course, we've, um, this has been a, a extraordinarily rich, is that uh, the invitation, of course, at the end of Atlas Hugged in the epilogue is to uh, um, cross over into the real world. And, uh, and I think that what we provided is a pretty in-depth picture of that world that you might cross over into. So I would think that... Uh, that's what's in store for somebody who, who enters this through Atlas Hugged, is captured by it, you might say, is only a story can capture you and then says, what can I do on the basis of this? You know, what, what, how, how, can, how can this be brought about? I don't, I don't think I'm boasting when I say more than any other novel I know or have ever heard about, um, it's possible to cross over from the fictional world into the real world and work to make it happen based on um, everything that we've been that we've been doing. And that's in part because I wrote the novel over a seven year period. So then the story truly co-evolved with my real world uh, change effort. They're knitted together at so many points that um, that that's what makes it, um, it, it possible to cross over. So my fondest wish is for 
basically for Atlas Hugged to have the same cultural impact as Atlas Shrugged, and for that to result in a flood of people basically encountering, basically coming over to what we're trying to do together um, with many others uh, in the real world, uh, just to attract many, many more people to that. So that is uh, my fondest hope, is that it can be a kind of a gateway for many, many people to do the kinds of things that we're doing to um, evolve the future in the real world. And, and on a practical note, David, if there are those in our audience who are interested in really taking this model into organizations yep. as we move towards gaining closure, the, one of the issues I've run into, and this may be more my idiosyncratic shtick than, than part of pro-social per se, but I, I've gotten feedback about people who look at this slide and say, I don't see how these two things fit together. It looks like you're asking me to think in two different ways about what's going on. And the way I, I respond to that is to say, well, let's put it in the matrix, right? Here's our lower right quadrant. When an organization is working well, these kinds of principles are being attended to. But in a human organization, emotional reactivity and issues and narratives are going to arise we are going to engage in fight flight kinds of behaviors. We do need some way of noticing or monitoring. We need a way of getting back on track and we need a way of dealing with conflict. So pragmatically speaking, when I'm working in an organization, I find it helpful to present it in an integrated kind of way. Yep. And, yep. and then, a la the symbols that you use in your book, I thought you might get a kick out of a slide that I used in an earlier presentation, where from that famous Earthrise shot, mm -hmm. I located the core design principles around a view of the planet. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and, there it is. And there's the Earth, basically. Right. Right? Can we get far enough away that we can see the whole planet and see how much what we're talking about here speaks to that as kind of our penultimate stepping back? Yeah. And so um, this is so exciting, Stu. I should say at the very end of this that uh, we put together a panel on Atlas Hugden and contextual behavioral science at the uh, which will be at the next annual meeting of the association for contextual behavioral science and on the panel will be oh such great people steve hayes himself uh, lisa coin the current president of acbs and uh, louise hayes a past president of acbs are all going to be up there talking uh, with us talking about uh, this this is like a um, extensive preparation uh, for that. And I might also um, highly, highly recommend that um, for anyone who views this and um, to, to think about joining the Association for Contextual Behavioral Science. It's a large organization, I think over 9,000 people, both uh, academics and practitioners around the world. And it has been a major, major vehicle for spreading pro-social, and of half of pro-social, of course, is, is um, drawn from um, um, acceptance and commitment uh, training. So I would love uh, uh, Atlas Hugged, among other things, to uh, increase membership in ACB, um, ACBS. I think that would be a great, a great um, 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 outcome. All right, my friend, do you want the last word? Uh, well, <laughs> with you having announced the panel, I, I do hope that uh, the program committee accepts the panel. So, uh, so we'll they, have better, to see, uh, they better at this point <laughs> now. Um, and, and yeah, I think, uh, you know, if, if people can join the association, there's references available about everything that we talked about. I mean, there's your books to turn to. There's a book now about pro-social 
that you and Steve Hayes and Paul Atkins have published. And, and there's a wealth of resources about ACT and about relational frame theory available. So if people just Google contextual science or ACBS, that'll get them there. And yep. uh, yes, join, join us, join in. Yep. All righty. All right, my friend. This was awesome. David, my pleasure. This was great. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank Thanks. you so much.